everybody, John Bornstein here, and this is Cable Lane. Today we're talking about the Christmas tree conundrum. That's right, this time of year as folks are decorating their homes for the Christmas season, even Christians might find that they're adding a Christmas tree to their living room decor, and others might find that that's somewhat offensive. Well, they typically will use scripture to make that case. One particular text is found in Jeremiah chapter 10. Others are even found in the book of Isaiah. Let's try to examine and those here today, because the last thing we want to see within the church is division. That's exactly what the enemy wants to cause. And, and we can all have our opinions about uh, the origin of various traditions and even those festivals and holidays that we observe. And these are good questions to have. But let's try to bring some clarity to the Christmas tree subject. Let's examine Jeremiah chapter 10. In the very beginning, I would say let's look at Jeremiah as a whole, because before we even get to that particular chapter, what we have to understand is that that particular section, in fact, many within the book of Jeremiah, starting in Jeremiah chapter 7 all the way to chapter 44, address idol worship. That's really the key issue here. So we got to make sure that we put the right context before us. This is about idols, not about Christmas trees. And, and we need to then examine number two here, the fact that, that this really is about handcrafted or carved idols, not just something that supplants something else. And that's typically what idol worship does. If we've put something in the place of our worship of God, that is an idol. Well, in this particular case, they were actually making hand-carved objects. They would cut something down, i.e. a tree, and they would fashion it into an object to be worshiped. Let's look at the text together, starting in verse 3 of Jeremiah chapter 10. For the customs of the peoples are futile. For one cuts a tree from the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. Now, the word work that we can draw from that in the English is actually from the Hebrew word ma'asai. And that's an interesting word because what it gives us an image of is taking a substance, a piece of material, and crafting it into something else. It would be likened unto the gold that was used for the golden calf in Exodus chapter 32. Now, if we look to verse 8, here's what we read. But they are altogether dull-hearted and foolish. A wooden idol is a worthless doctrine. Now, it doesn't get much clearer than that. The proper context here, using an exegetical perspective, not, not an eisegesis perspective, but rather reading it for what it says, it's quite clear. This is about idol worship. You go back to verse 5. Here's what he says. Their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field, and they cannot speak. They have to be carried, for they cannot walk. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither is it in them to do good. So there's a carved mouth that can't speak. Uh, there are carved limbs that can do nothing. It can't even walk. This is clearly not a Christmas tree. So again, putting it in a proper context here, we need to understand what the message is. These are carved objects that are taking the rightful place of God the Father, of Yahweh, in and through their lives. This was a condemnation against the people. Now, clearly we could say anything that takes the place of God could be deemed as an idol and should be removed from our lives. Let's take it another step further. If we look at Isaiah chapter 44, it really covers some similar thoughts processes here of Jeremiah chapter 10. I'll read to you verses 14b to 17. Listen to this. He plants a pine and the rain nourishes it. Then it shall be for a man to burn, for he will take some of it and warm himself. Yes, he kindles it and bakes bread. Indeed, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it a carved image and falls down to it. He burns half of it in the fire. With this half, he eats meat. He roasts a roast and is satisfied. And he even warms himself and says, ah, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his carved image. He falls down before it and worships it, prays to it and says, deliver me for you are my god. Now, what you see there is quite clear the issue at hand. This is a piece of wood Half of it was used to warm a home, to use in preparation of a meal. And then the other half was used to carve into an image 
to be worshipped. Again, this is clearly not a Christmas tree in proper context. Uh, thirdly, let's just look at the fact that putting a Christmas tree into this Jeremiah 10 context is anachronistic. An anachronism is an attributing something, a custom, an event, uh, an object of one particular time period and putting it into something else. It's not consistent. It's it sounds similar, so we take uh, we, we don't really consider perhaps 2,500 years of time. It sounds like something that's familiar to us, so we just put it right into that text, rather than reading it in proper context for what it says. Now, if we go to gotquestions.org, and they're a great organization, even based here in Colorado Springs, listen to what they have to say on this. The modern custom of a Christmas tree does not come from any form of paganism. There is no evidence of any pagan religion decorating a special holiday tree for their midwinter festivals. Although the Romans celebrated the winter solstice with a festival called Saturnalia in honor of the Saturnus, the god of agriculture, they decorated their houses with greens and lights and exchanged gifts. Late in the Middle Ages, Germans and Scandinavians placed evergreen trees inside their homes or just outside their doors to show their hope in the forthcoming spring. The first Christmas tree was decorated by Protestant Christians in 16th century Germany. So if the first Christmas tree wasn't even decorated until the 1500s, it's quite clear that we can't take a gap of a text that was given to us around 580 to 630 BC and apply that to what is happening today. So whatever choice we make, quite frankly, we have to have a clear conscience before God and men. This really has to be a decision that we make before God. What's in the best interest of our home that we don't have anything that distracts us ultimately from the mission that's before us. And quite frankly, that mission is quite clear that we go into all the world and preach the gospel, making disciples of all nations, right? We have quite a clear mission that is before us. But what we do is quite frankly, we get caught up in all these minors and we make those the majors and then divide amongst one another and even lead churches over these matters. May it never be. If we go to Romans chapter 14, verses 5 to 6, we see one person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks, and he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat, and gives God thanks. Again, whatever traditions might be around your home, even at your dinner table, whatever you do as far as getting together with family, the main point of this is that we keep the main thing the main thing. And what is the reason for the season, after all? It's Jesus Christ, our Lord. May that be the message that is before us. And may we not get divided over such matters. Now, of course, I want you to be concerned for the well-being of someone else, that you don't create a stumbling block nor a distraction. If you have a family member that might be offended by a Christmas tree, well, then consider their needs and what's in their best interest that they would hear the word of God. That's our mission after all. So let's not make our traditions the main thing. But if we are going to try to make a case against or for a Christmas tree, then let's use the right text to do so. Let's not manipulate the Bible to make our point but rather let us know the truth, because after all, the truth will set us free. I want to thank you for watching again this Cable Lane episode. I want to wish you a very Merry Christmas, and we'll see you next week. God bless you, my friends. Take care.